This SciShow video is supported by SciStarter, a site of thousands of citizen science projects and events in need of help from people like you. Maybe you have strolled past one of these plants on a hike somewhere in North America. Maybe it was their beautiful bell-like flowers that caught your eye. But these brightly colored blooms hold a scientific secret. Although their flowers might look different close up, they are actually all the same species. Sort of. And that's the rub. They kind of mess with the whole idea of what a species is. These unassuming mountain flowers are straining scientists' understanding of genetics to the breaking point. These flowers are all beard tongues, or members of the Penstemon genus. The purple ones are the New Mexico beard tongue and the upright blue beard tongue, while the red ones are just called beard tongues. But more than that, they are all part of what's called a species complex, referring to two or more species that are so closely related that they almost count as one. As a quick reminder, generally we define a species as a group of organisms that can breed with one another in nature but can't breed with similar organisms of another group or species. The members of a species might look pretty similar to one another, but they don't have to. What differentiates these beard tongues is that each flower is specially adapted to suit the thing that pollinates it. The New Mexico and upright beard tongues have wide purpley blue flowers, perfect for attracting insects like bees, who are great at seeing blue to ultraviolet light, and want a nice little landing pad to plop down on when they gather nectar. The red beard tongues, on the other hand, are mostly pollinated by hummingbirds, who prefer red colors and don't need a landing pad, since they can just hover there to suck out the loads of nectar sitting deep in the flower's bell. Since the hummingbirds and the bees don't cross over to the flowers they don't like, red flower pollen rarely reaches blue flowers and vice versa. That drives the species apart. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't reproduce with one another. Despite our definitions, genes may continue to be exchanged between recently diverged species. But the way that that's happening in beard tongues is weird. Like, really weird. To understand why, we need to talk about the law of independent assortment. This goes all the way back to Mendel, the pea plant guy. For the most part, the different flavors of a gene, also called alleles, will be split up into reproductive cells independent from the alleles of another gene. If gene A and gene B are on two different chromosomes, those two chromosomes are gonna go their own separate ways. In fact, if they're far apart on the same chromosome, that can happen too, because chromosomes love getting together and swapping arms as reproductive cells are made. This means, say, the genes for hair color probably won't influence the genes for some other feature, like height. Except, independent assortment also says that some genes aren't all that independent from one another. They're actually passed on or inherited together. Such genes are said to be linked. Usually, when this happens, the genes are physically close to one another on the same chromosome. Think about it like this. If you're traveling in a car, you wouldn't expect the other cars to end up in the same place you're going. They're all moving independently. But if you're on a bus, some of the other passengers will probably also get off at the same stop. In the case of flowers, you might have genes for shape, color, or size that are all very close to one another and all passed down to baby flowers in a group. This is actually what happens in various species of petunias. There are genes for color, scent, and size that make one petunia species different from another and travel together in a group. And it would make sense if beard tongues were doing that, they are not. In fact, they are bending those rules almost to the point of snapping. When researchers in 2023 peeked under the genetic hood of these bell-shaped beauties, they found around 21 loci, or places, on eight chromosomes that were all traveling together and being inherited as a group. And here's the part where this episode becomes an unexpected plea for more people to do PhDs in plant genetics, because the language in the paper is couched in molecular biology hedges, so since no one sat down and proved the function of each of these genetic loci, so we can't actually say what they do. However, it seems like the genes in these places are key to defining the bird and bee features of each flower. But instead of those genes sitting close to each other on one particular chromosome, they were spread out over all the whole genome, and all of the DNA in between was not traveling together. Think about how weird this is. Like, imagine you're on the interstate and there's a bunch of cars, and there's 21 of them that are all taking the same route and ending up in the same place every time, even though they are not planned to go to the same place. Like, there's nothing making them stick together. So that 
is asking for an explanation. The researchers think it's because there's a strong selective pressure to keep the groups of genes that make the hummingbird-pollinated and bee-pollinated flowers. So they'll be passed down through generations, sticking together, or getting off at the same exit, even if that means bending the usual inheritance rules. Because there's a good reason for hummingbird flowers to stay hummingbird flowers and bee flowers to stay bee flowers. Hybrid flowers between the two are really, really rare. So you might get a hybrid purple baby flower, and that flower could breed with another hybrid to keep making these intermediate purple flowers, but it won't, because the birds and the bees are both gonna see it and go like, I don't actually care that much about that flower, and then move on. That means that hybrids are more likely to backcross with one of the parent species. Really quickly, the offspring of the hybrids are going to end up with all blue flower traits or all red flower traits again, because that's what the pollinators will pollinate. But the hybrid did still happen, so the genes were still swapped between the reds and the blues, meaning these 21 cars are selectively pressured to stay together, despite not being physically connected, but everything in between them can move. So it looks like the reds and blues are breaking the law of independent assortment, with these 21 unconnected loci staying together, but natural selection beats out everything else and forces those traits to stay in a group. The big question that still remains is how much of the shared DNA between the reds and the blues is because the flowers recently split into different species, and how much of it is because of gene flow happening afterward. Figuring this out could not only explain what's going on with beard tongues, but also help geneticists understand the early stages of how species split off from one another. These flowers could even help uncover how species evolve new traits quickly to adapt to environmental changes, like those stemming from the climate crisis. So rather than a freak of nature, beard tongues might just be the next pea plant, revealing brand new truths about genetics. Hi folks, Reed here. This SciShow video is supported by SciStarter, a site with thousands thousands of citizen science projects and events in need of help from people like you. SciStarter connects people to projects, providing you with training and step-by-step -step instructions, all for free. Using their project finder, you can choose an investigation that you're passionate about. Then, once you've started collecting data, you can track your progress through your SciStarter account. This April, or should I say this Citizen Science Month, SciStarter's goal is to collectively generate over 1 million data points for citizen science projects. And you can help. Whether you work at a big company like Verizon, are a member of a national organization like the Girl Scouts, or simply a curious person, SciStarter has projects to fit your goals and interests. You can even join today to learn how. From playing a video game that accelerates medical research, to taking pictures of nature for conservation research, to attending a citizen science event near you, there are tons of ways to get involved. Once you complete your investigation at the end of Citizen Science Month, you can find your next adventure at SciStarter.org. Thanks to SciStarter for supporting this SciShow video, and thank you for staying curious. 